Thank you very much. The next item of business is a Finance and Constitution Committee debate on motion 23565 in the name of Bruce Crawford on Parliament's evolving scrutiny function. Can I ask all members who wish to speak in the debate please to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Bruce Crawford to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And President Officer, this has been a quite an extraordinary year. And the focus of the Scottish Government, our Parliament and its committees has rightly been on dealing with the impact of the ongoing COVID-19 emergency. But as we near the end of the Brexit transition period, the Finance and Constitution Committee has also been focused on the constitutional impact of the UK leaving the EU on devolution. More specifically, President Officer, the impact on our Parliament's powers and what it means for how we conduct scrutiny. At the outset, it's important to recognise that my contribution is not going to be about whether it's a question of a power grab or a power surge. Brexit itself neither directly increases or decreases the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Any change to the powers of the Parliament requires UK legislation. For example, the UK Internal Market Bill re-reserves subsidy control, which means that the UK Government will be able to introduce state aid legislation without the need to seek consent from the devolved legislators. This Parliament has, of course, refused consent, but it's likely to be imposed whatever the strongly held views. However, the main impact of Brexit on devolution is to remove the obligation of this Parliament to both implement changes to EU law in devolved areas and not to legislate in any way contrary to EU law. It is this constraint which is being removed. All else being equal, from the 1st of January 2021, this Parliament would have had legislative autonomy in any devolved policy area previously within EU competence. But the reality is actually a bit different, presiding officer. This is because other constraints will replace the existing requirement to comply with EU law and will essentially limit our legislative autonomy. Unfortunately, with only three weeks to the end of the transition period, the extent of these constraints remains highly uncertain. There are essentially two levels of constraint, external and domestic. External constraints include the requirement to comply with international treaties agreed by the UK, including trade deals. The level of regulatory alignment within the EU as part of any trade deal will there be of critical importance to determining this Parliament's level of legislative autonomy after Brexit. The extent of domestic constraints, such as common frameworks on the use of Parliament's legislative powers, also remains unclear. This is partly because the UK Government and devolved governments cannot fully agree on how this should work. But while there is nevertheless broad agreement on developing common frameworks consensually as the most effective way of, dealing, of delivering an appropriate level of regulatory coherence across the UK, there has of course been specific problems in regard to the Emissions Trading Scheme framework, for instance, which I'm sure We'll hear more about this afternoon. And the UK Government also continues to press ahead with its internal market bill, which, as I have said, does not have the consent of this Parliament. The Committee's view on this, with the exception of our Conservative colleagues, is that the bill undermines the whole basis of devolution. The market access principles in the bill essentially mean that regulatory standards agreed by the UK Parliament could effectively be imposed on the devolved nations. As such, it effectively imposes new reservations on devolved competencies. And common frameworks may also contain, constrain legislative autonomy in certain policy areas. But this at least will be with the agreement of the Scottish Government. Now, given these external and domestic constraints, a key question for the committee is the extent to which they will, in turn, also limit the use of the keeping pace power in the Continuity Bill. And this, presiding officer, 
brings me to the critical question in this debate. How is our Parliament's scrutiny function impacted upon and how do we need to evolve to meet challenges I've just outlined? So on this key question that we sought the views of other committees. The committee believes there is a need to ensure that as a Parliament we should facilitate engagement in the policy making process in areas which were previously subject to EU law. This is primarily because there, is no longer, there will no longer be any formal democratic engagement in the EU policy making process by the UK and devolved governments. But it's also because there's a risk that the EU policy making process is replaced by an executive driven process which allows for significant levels of ministerial discretion. For example, in deciding which EU law to keep pace with or deciding areas of policy governance in common frameworks. The responses that we've received from other committees confirm that there is recognition across the Parliament that we need to evolve our scrutiny process to address the risk of an overly executive driven process. Yeah. But, President Officer, it's also clear from the response we received that this raises significant resource implications. And these are threefold. First, it's essential that all members, and especially the new intake next May, are sufficiently supported in understanding the complex constitutional implications of Brexit on our Parliament's powers on an ongoing basis. It's also essential that we are able to provide the public with an understanding of how policy making in areas such as the environment and food standards will work after Brexit. But this will not be easy as the constraints are not static and in many respects will be agreed at an intergovernmental level. And second, this perhaps leads to the need to develop an interparliamentary approach in all policy areas previously within EU competence. Finally, it is clear, President Officer, from the responses we have received from other committees that there is not sufficient capacity within the existing committee structure. There is therefore a need for the Parliament at a strategic level to consider its scrutiny priorities in addressing the complex and dynamic impact of Brexit on devolution. President Officer, the last few years have seen a significant increase in the complexity, volume and diversity of policy areas this Parliament needs to scrutinise to ensure that they work for the people of Scotland. And as the committee responses we receive confirm, that requires resourcing if this Parliament is to continue to deliver a high quality and participative approach to scrutiny of policy and legislation in future. And critically, to ensure that members are supported to deliver robust scrutiny in a post-Brexit constitutional landscape. Given the tight fiscal environment, this may require difficult conversations about reprioritising existing resources. But this needs to start now, before the next session of Parliament begins. And in moving the motion in my name, on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee, can I also take this opportunity to thank uh, very much the clerks of, of the Finance and Constitution, Constitution Committee for all of their support in this process. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Graham Day. President Officer, I want to begin by uh, thanking Bruce Crawford and his committee for securing this important debate today because there is nothing more central to the role of the Parliament than scrutinising on behalf of the people it represents. That's scrutinising the actions of government, in this instance, the Scottish and the UK governments. And that, I think, is borne out by the participation of five different committees in the debate we're conducting this afternoon. Brexit has, as Bruce Crawford highlighted, raised a number of challenges around the exercise of this crucial scrutiny function. Before considering these in detail, though, I think it's essential we establish context. Brexit was not 
the choice of the people of Scotland. And we now face the most damaging form of Brexit that can be imagined, a choice between no deal or a very limited future relationship agreement, thanks to the approach of this UK Government. The approach of the UK Government is similarly crucial in considering the challenges we face in some of the specific matters we are debating here, notably UK frameworks and the Internal Market Bill, but also future international negotiations beyond those with the EU. But on the subject of approach, let me outline that of the Scottish Government to the topic before us. Let me be clear, we want to take all practical steps to support and encourage scrutiny by this Parliament and alongside that consultation with stakeholders. It may be we will not agree with the Parliament or some of the parties represented here on what all practical steps are, but with goodwill and the right intent on all sides, I am certain we can ensure that scrutiny is proportionate, balancing proper and thorough questioning with the need to progress business within the finite limits of parliamentary time. The Government and Parliament established protocols for scrutiny of the substantial range of secondary legislation already in place for leaving the EU. Now we must build on that for the new challenges ahead. And on Bruce Crawford's important point about resource to deliver that scrutiny, then of course the Government will listen to any reasoned financial ask via the Finance Committee from the Parliament. Presiding officer, there are three immediate relevant issues facing us. The UK frameworks, the UK Government's internal market bill and our own continuity bill. The negotiation and agreement of UK-wide frameworks in devolved areas is a largely new exercise in the UK. The four administrations have had to create principles and structures to allow us to negotiate and agree common approaches to issues where we agree this is in our best interest. The Scottish Government and indeed this Parliament have always been clear that UK frameworks must be agreed, not imposed, and must respect devolved powers. We are now moving to the detail of individual frameworks and the scrutiny by subject committees of the Parliament of those frameworks. The proposals for scrutiny are intended to secure effective scrutiny of an intergovernmental process requiring agreement across all four executives and legislators. I reiterate the, government of, uh, the commitment of this Government to enable effective scrutiny by this Parliament of these frameworks. It is clear, however, that agreement of frameworks and proper democratic accountability requires respect and trust between all four administrations. And regrettably, recent events concerning the proposed emissions trading scheme framework again call into question the commitment of the UK Government to this approach. Presiding officer, it would be wholly unacceptable and undermine the common frameworks process if UK ministers unilaterally introduced an alternative carbon tax regime against the wishes of the other UK administrations. And I'm sure that view will find support across this Parliament. The UK Government has, of course, already severely damaged the frameworks process through its internal market bill. The many flaws of this legislation are well rehearsed, but it is worth reflecting here on its implications specifically for the UK frameworks. Put bluntly, the bill removes any need for the UK Government to agree frameworks if they do not like the outcome of negotiations. The market access principles will ensure that they do not need to conform to our regulations if they are different from those in England. That would also be true if the UK Government uh, decided unilaterally to withdraw from any UK framework already agreed. There is no protection in the Internal Market Bill for matters under negotiation for UK frameworks, nor any protection for matters in agreed framework. So the Internal Market Bill does not only undermine devolution in common frameworks, it undermines scrutiny by this Parliament in the discharge of its democratic responsibility. The Scottish Government's Continuity Bill, of course, also raises new issues of scrutiny for the Parliament, as Bruce Crawford has set out. In essence, the Parliament will rightly want to examine the proposals the Government is making to maintain alignment in devolved areas with the high standards of EU law. The normal processes of secondary legislation will provide the Parliament the opportunity to approve individual exercises of the powers in the Bill. But stage two consideration showed that members have a range of other proposals to ensure wider scrutiny of the government's plans in this area. And I know that Michael Russell is reflecting on those proposals and will listen to any further points made today as the government considers its approach to stage three of the bill later this month. Sign officer, Brexit has also focused attention on parliamentary oversight of negotiations of international treaties. And again, the approach of the UK government has shown clearly the flaws in the current system. 
The Westminster Parliament itself was excluded from any role in shaping negotiating positions. The devolved administrations and legislators are shut out too, despite many devolved matters being directly affected by the UK Government's position and the negotiations. This is clearly unacceptable in a modern democracy. This Parliament rightly would not accept such an approach from the Scottish Government. Why would it accept one from a UK Government? While the circumstances of Brexit are not of our making, uh, President Officer, as a responsible Government and Parliament, we must face up to these new challenges. We should be proud of the work that's been done so far to fulfil our duty to provide a functioning legal system suitably scrutinised and approved. And I'm sure that working together, we can ensure that future measures, such as common frameworks in alignment with EU law, are developed properly by the Government and rigorously examined by this Parliament, always with the best interests of the people of Scotland as our aim. Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Dean Lockhart to be followed by Anna Sauer. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I would also like to thank the clerks and advisors to the Finance and Constitution Committee, who have worked tremendously hard through a never increasing volume of primary and secondary legislation and parliamentary reports. Let me start by agreeing with uh, Bruce Crawford when he said that this is the beginning of a very important debate, a debate surrounding the future role of this parliament in scrutinising the exercise of powers in a post-Brexit settlement. The backdrop is that this parliament next year, after the transition period, will have more powers than ever. Over 100 new powers coming directly this, uh, to this parliament following the transition period in a number of areas covering air quality, animal welfare, land use, harbour regulation and energy efficiency. The Parliament will also have oversight over substantial new powers across agriculture, fisheries, procurement and food packaging that are subject to the common frameworks. And also, in addition to all of this, new legislation in the form of the EU Continuity Bill and the UK Internal Market Bill will generate yet more regulatory change that will require scrutiny and stakeholder consultation. How these significant new powers will be scrutinised by this Parliament is being considered by the, the Committee as part of its legacy inquiry, and it will be for members returned in the next session to determine exactly how all this will work in the years to come. But it is important that we start the debate now, uh, a debate about how these powers will be used, how they will be scrutinised, and how the Scottish Government will remain accountable to this Parliament. Presiding officer, I want to touch on some of the common themes emerging from the responses received from the various committees. It didn't come as a surprise that most committees uh, had questions surrounding the use of the keep pace powers under the continuity bill and also raised a number of important challenges uh, that uh, this legislation will give rise to. Committees noted that the task of monitoring changes to EU laws was previously done at a UK level and that after the transition period, we will have no formal role in influencing or amending future EU laws. This reflects evidence also given to the committee at stage one of the bill by Professor Eileen McCarg, who cautioned that this parliament will become a passive rule taker and that in those circumstances, it seems hard to justify putting extensive keep pace powers into the hands of Scottish government ministers. The committee's own stage one report reflected these concerns by concluding that it is essential the Parliament give serious consideration to the level of scrutiny of the keeping pace powers, and that's part of what we are debating today. It's therefore welcome, Presiding Officer, that a number of committees did look at this question and responded by calling on Parliament and stakeholders to be able to scrutinise Scottish Government decisions on whether or not to keep pace with particular EU policy developments and suggesting that committees of this Parliament should have a role in those decisions. In fact, the Delegated Powers Committee went so far as recommending that primary legislation would be the most appropriate vehicle for keeping pace with developments at an EU level. Uh, presiding officer, these committee responses reflect a number of amendments we lodged at stage two of the EU Continuity Bill, which were uh, designed to address these concerns. First, we suggested that this parliament, or if more appropriate, a relevant committee, 
have the ability to consider the relevant procedure which should apply to keep pace regulations brought forward by Scottish ministers. In particular, the power to decide whether the keep pace regulations should be subject to the negative procedure, the affirmative or super affirmative procedure, or whether indeed they should be subject to uh, primary legislation. And if Parliament or, if relevant, a sifting committee decided that the super affirmative procedure should apply, for example, if the keep pace provi uh, provisions represented a significant change in Scots law or Scottish Government policy, then this would require the Scottish Government to undertake impact assessments and stakeholder consultations. Uh, these amendments were all based on, on submissions from the NFUS and a number of other stakeholders. And I'll take forward the Minister's invitation. These, not all of these amendments were agreed at stage two, so I'm, I'm very happy to work with the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary and other parties to agree amendments at stage three that will address the concerns raised by various committees on, on these particular issues. The second common theme emerging from uh, the committee responses centred around the need for a much more active and detailed scrutiny process surrounding the common frameworks. There was recognition that the common frameworks themselves won't alter devolution, but they will constrain, albeit voluntarily and subject to continued agreement, this Parliament's ability to agree policy divergence in a number of areas. The consensus across the committees, therefore, is that the development of the common frameworks must involve a, a higher level of transparency and an opportunity for Parliament uh, to scrutinise the powers being uh, subjected to the common frameworks. Uh, however, the Environment Committee did identify a number of serious concerns, including Parliament being asked to consider legislative elements of frameworks without sight of the relevant framework itself, and a real failure to engage stakeholders and the wider public in the process of developing common frameworks. And it has to be said, these concerns relate to the process undertaken by both the Scottish Government and the UK Government. I think it's worth uh, highlighting that the REC Committee noted that this is a structural problem and it relates to how the intergovernmental process operates, in particular the emphasis on confidentiality. Um, however, the REC Committee went on to say that if this is not addressed, there is a real concern that common frameworks could represent a shift towards a greater degree of intergovernmental decision making where the scrutiny, scrutiny role of parliaments is significantly diminished. And I'm sure, presiding officer, uh, all of us here in the chamber will want to avoid an outcome where this process is executive driven and does not involve uh, a relevant amount of parliamentary scrutiny. And this is something I think both the Scottish Government, UK Government and this Parliament should be looking to address going forwards. Um, officer, let me conclude on an issue on which I think there is uh, support across the chamber. All the committees highlighted the significant resource implications for this parliament as a consequence of the additional powers I've mentioned and the additional scrutiny functions that will vest in this parliament uh, from the beginning of uh, next year. This is an issue I think that will become increasingly urgent and I would uh, conclude by urging a cross-party consensus to be reached on what additional capacity and what additional resources will be required for this parliament and its committees to address the issues I've outlined above. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now call Anna Sauer to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking Bruce Crawford and his committee for bringing forward this debate uh, today. Thank him. As uh, I was previously the acting convener of the Public Audit Committee, so we had the uh, ability to respond back. But also, having now left the committee and joining the Finance and Constitution Committee, uh, I want to say that I look forward to serving under Mr Crawford's uh, chairmanship. Uh, Presiding Officer, I am, uh, of course, saddened that the UK is leaving the EU. Uh, my view on Brexit is clear as, as for many members in this uh, chamber. And I wish we weren't even having this debate today. Um, it's not something I supported. Um, I don't believe Brexit is good for the UK or indeed good uh, for Scotland. But whatever your view on Brexit, as parliamentarians in the Scottish Parliament, we do have to deal with the here and now of what Brexit means for the Scottish Parliament and how it functions both as a legislator and, importantly, how it functions as a body able to properly and timidly scrutinise and hold the executive and the Scottish Government to account of whichever political shade that may be. And that is the approach that Scottish Labour will be taking. So, in some ways, today's debate shouldn't be 
party political, but of course it is political. Uh, and I'm sure to Bruce Crawford's internal shame, um, it, uh, having a, a consensual motion seconded by uh, Mar Murdo Fraser is a good indication of that, that this is about trying to bring some consensus in the chamber about what should happen uh, next. Um, I also don't want today's debate to be dominated by the much uh, more political debate about the rights and wrongs of Brexit itself, on the impact of Scotland, or indeed the Withdrawal Bill, the Internal Market Bill, or the impact on devolved policy areas and devolution. Of course, that is important, uh, but that is probably for a different opportunity than today. Uh, that's not the purpose of today's debate. Uh, today's debate is about the role of Parliament, uh, the scrutiny, and frankly, resources available to the Parliament to hold the executive to account. I would hope that every MSP believes there should be a properly resourced and functioning Parliament with the necessary capability to pass legislation and scrutinise the executive. I must also say that in relation to committees, um, I do think there's a debate to be had, discussion to be had about how we can take some of the party politics away from committees uh, as well, and in itself will help with scrutiny. And I say that um, as, as I say, having come off the audit committee, where I've, I've got to give credit to all my colleagues that served on the audit uh, committee with me. Um, I think they would all agree that we are very good as a committee, or we are very good as a committee, at avoiding party politics and actually together uniting on the issues that were relevant uh, to the Scottish people in terms of our scrutiny work uh, through the audit. Um, and I think you can see a level of consensus that have come from the committee's responses uh, to uh, Mr Crawford's letter. I think that's a good thing because the Parliament has changed since 1999 and I'm sure it will want to continue to change and adapt in the years to come. Uh, and while some new scrutiny processes established uh, by the Scottish Government are working well, uh, committees are already struggling with both a lack of capacity and timely information provided by the UK Government and consequently the Scottish Government, for example, in the area of common frameworks. Uh, that is not good enough and prevents Parliament from doing its job. Uh, and the withdrawal bill itself, um, again, not getting into the politics of the actual withdrawal bill, but the, but the um, two reasons it's problematic um, in terms of scrutiny is, of course, it gives much power to ministers, um, and I think that requires adequate scrutiny to go alongside that in terms of that power. And then also around the keeping pace powers, uh, which I think is a, at the moment currently beyond the capacity of our parliamentary committees to adequately respond to. Uh, and Scottish ministers will be able to make regulations corresponding to EU regulations, tertiary legislation or decisions. Uh, the regulations will also be able to enforce the laws, uh, implement di directives or modify any retained EU law. Uh, I think it would be incomprehensible for the executive and minister to have such powers without corresponding parliamentary scrutiny. And that is why the government must work with committees and parliament as a matter of urgency to ensure that changes in our laws and governance structures can be adequately scrutinised by the parliament. I know that is a commitment that Mr Day gave in his opening remarks. I hope that those commitments are matched up with action uh, too, and it is in the collective effort of all of us in this parliament to make that happen. Uh, because there are too many incidents in recent months where the Scottish Government has, sadly, sought to sideline or ignore uh, the will of parliament. And I do not mean that in a partisan sense. Um, if it was a Labour executive and parliament as a whole uh, voted uh, to, in terms of one position, and was directing the, the government of the day, I would expect the government of the day to listen to that will of parliament. I expect that if it's a Labour administration, an SNP administration, or an administration of any other political colour. That has to uh, be the case if we are to respect this parliament and the people that elect us to come to this parliament. Uh, the committee noted that the Scottish government are using the UK withdrawal uh, from the European Union Scotland bill to legislate so that some Scottish laws keep pace with EU laws as a default position. Uh, and that role of the Scottish Government in monitoring EU developments in devolved policy areas will be a new role, and as such, there is a need for scrutiny of the Scottish Government on whether or not they choose to keep pace with specific EU policy uh, developments. Uh, the Health and Sport Committee, which I know the Deputy Presiding Officer is acutely aware of, acting as its uh, chair, uh, said uh, that it believes that its committee, uh, and indeed possibly even other committees, should have a role in decisions and whether or not to keep pace in order to provide democratic engagement with the Scottish Government Minister's decisions uh, on these matters. Uh, there were also concerns that the mutual recognition of standards could result in standards effectively being imposed in Scotland and undermining devolved powers. Um, in its view, the parliamentary involvement and meaningful stakeholder engagement at the earliest opportunity is therefore vital in internal market policy development. Uh, the Finance and Conscience Committee in particular identified the need for Parliament and its committee to consider how it needs to involve, uh, evolve 
Um, and I'll just close with uh, these remarks, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, br with what Bruce Crawford said right at the opening. Uh, this is not just about the members of the Parliament in this chamber that we sit in today. It's about those that come and follow us in the next Parliament and for Parliament after that. It's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we have a Parliament that is true to the values of democracy, to accountability and to scrutiny, regardless of who is in positions of power, who are in positions on committees or who indeed are backbenchers. That's a collective interest of all of us in the democratic rights of the Scottish people. Thank you very much. I now call Mike Rumble. Uh, sorry, my apologies, Patrick Harvey, to be followed by Mike Rumble. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful to all of the committees who've uh, contributed their perspective. But I fear that issues are being raised here that the Scottish Parliament will not be able to satisfactorily resolve uh, within ourselves. The, the events of 2020 have inevitably taken a huge amount of public attention away from the Brexit crisis. But the public health crisis we've been living through should be a reminder that the way power is exercised and the way it's held accountable in a democracy must be capable of operating in challenging times, even in an emergency, not just in good times. I would have liked to have thought that even the most extremist anti-European would have thought twice about proceeding with Brexit in the middle of a global pandemic if they'd known it was coming. But given the way the UK government has refused every opportunity to think again, it does seem clear that they do put their own ideological obsession ahead of everything, ahead even of life and death. So it should be no surprise, therefore, that they also put it ahead of Scotland's right to govern itself. That right, albeit limited in its current form, was reasserted in the final years of the last century. We voted for a devolved parliament, and it was created on the basis that whatever was not explicitly reserved was devolved, and that changes to the devolution framework, including the powers exercised by this parliament, would require the consent of this parliament. These principles are now under a sustained and systematic assault by a UK government which clearly holds them in contempt. So this is the context in which we're now forced to consider the important questions uh, about the impact on devolution arising from a Brexit crisis Scotland rejected and the implications for parliamentary scrutiny. The issue of policy divergence, though, is not new. In my first years as an MSP back in 2003 and 2004, I was involved in debates on issues from charity law to protection of the marine environment, in which Scottish and UK governments and parliaments were legislating in areas with significant cross-border issues, legislating separately but in parallel, each jurisdiction taking account of their different circumstances, while also seeking to achieve a coherent overall approach. To me, this is the right way and the most democratic way to achieve what we now call a common framework. It's also the simplest way to ensure that parliamentary scrutiny takes place in the way that Parliament thinks it should. Any other approach raises really serious questions, questions that are not only about parliamentary scrutiny, but also about the balance of power between Parliament and government. Any government will inevitably be drawn to arguments which protect its ability to make decisions. Every parliament should be focused on the need to hold those decisions accountable. This balance of power issue is even more important in a parliament with a fair voting system where single party majorities can be expected to be rare. If we accept a, a principle that the UK and Scottish governments and others within GB or UK will reach agreement among themselves about common approaches, then the challenge of parliamentary scrutiny becomes significant but manageable. We should avoid, for example, arrangements which allow the Scottish Government to decide for itself the correct level of scrutiny, such as saying that they will not normally adopt a position without parliamentary approval. That language would echo the weak and undefined legislative consent principle. And we have seen how a government which has no respect for that principle can abuse it to the extent that it is rendered meaningless. More challenging than scrutiny of common frameworks, though, is the question of power. Once a common framework has been agreed between the governments, even with the consent of the parliament of the day, how much power will the people of Scotland have 
to elect a parliament which will end that framework and see, seek a different agreement? How much power will a future parliament have to ensure that changes are made to common frameworks or indeed to ensure that changes are resisted if a minority government disagrees with a parliamentary majority? I cannot see any satisfactory answers to these questions. And worst of all, of course, is what is to happen if the UK government continues with its wrecking ball approach to devolution, its internal market bill, while some in the Conservative Party try to maintain that it poses no threat to devolution, their colleagues like Jacob Rees-Mogg have a habit of saying the quiet bit out loud and making their true intentions very clear. If the UK government does impose its own decisions in devolved areas in, ways, in the way that is so clearly threatened, how will those decisions be held to scrutiny? UK ministers are notoriously unwilling to appear before this Parliament's committees. And they cannot answer questions in the chamber from MSPs elected to hold devolved power accountable. And they will never face the judgment of the Scottish electorate either. The example of the European Emissions Trading Scheme is of critical importance, but it is in truth only one of a huge range of environmental, social and economic issues in which this Parliament's role must be respected. And that respect appears entirely absent from the UK government's approach. Ultimately, presiding officer, these issues must be resolved by the people of Scotland. They are sovereign in their country. If the UK government and those who want Scotland to choose to remain part of the UK want the people of Scotland to be able to exercise their sovereignty by electing people to their parliament, then they must end the threat to overturn the fundamental basis on which that parliament operates. And if the UK government instead continues with its current course, the people of Scotland will have only one option left by which they can continue to assert their right to self-government, and that is to complete the journey and take our place as an independent member of the international community and rejoin the family of European nations. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Mike Rumbles to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Presiding officer, <clears throat> there's no doubt that Brexit is having and will have a major impact on how the Scottish Parliament operates. And the paper produced by the Finance and Constitution Committee, and indeed this debate, is a welcome part of the process of examining how this devolved Parliament responds to changing circumstances. In my contribution today, time allows me to concentrate on just one of the five major areas of concern. <clears throat> that, that of how the Scottish Parliament holds the Scottish Government to account over the keeping pace power currently identified in the Scottish Government's UK withdrawal from the European Continuity Scotland Bill, which has already completed the Stage 2 process and comes before the whole Parliament in just two weeks' time. Now, I believe that anything which makes trade between Scotland and the rest of the UK, and indeed with this Bill, trade between Scotland and our European neighbours, must be a good thing. And it's on that basis I voted for the general principles of the Bill at Stage 1. However, when it came to stage two of the bill, I was very disappointed, to say the least, to find that the Scottish Government opposed any change in their proposed use of regulations for the keeping pace power. The sole use of regulations for the keeping pace power means that, unlike with primary legislation, the Scottish Parliament has no power. It has no power to amend government legislative proposals when they bring them forward. Unfortunately, I see Mike Russell, the Minister responsible, shaking his head, but it is the truth. Unfortunately, the role of Parliament is to be somewhat neutered under these proposals. And let me explain what I mean. All governments use regulations, but they are meant to be used for uncontroversial, minor adjustments or keeping our laws up to date and are usually nodded through up to 28 days after they come into effect. We've seen over the last nine months that regulations have been used for quite drastic and controversial measures and can be justified. But my concern is that ministers seem determined to expand the use of regulations with the keeping pace powers in this bill. If major, and that's what I'm talking about, if major changes are to be made to our laws, then the proper place to do this is with primary legislation so that Parliament can properly interrogate and improve our laws rather than simply accepting them or rejecting them. And that's what you have to do with regulations. 
I'm concerned, and MSPs from across the chamber should be concerned, with two specific subsections of Section 4 of the Continuity Bill. Subsection 4D creates or widens the scope of a criminal offence. And subsection 4E creates or amends a power to legislate, all by regulation. Now, in the government's defence of these provisions, they say that Parliament can at any time go down the route of primary legislation rather than rely on regulations in this bill if that is what Parliament decides it wants to do. Of course, this is a truism, if ever there was one. But I'm afraid that this argument is not a valid argument. This bill gives the power to government to use regulations without the use of primary legislation to make cha major changes to our law. A criminal offence is a major change. If governments have the power to use regulations, then they are extremely unlikely to want to use a more lengthy but appropriate process. Parliament's ability to amend legislation will be curtailed. This should not be a party political issue. It's a parliamentary issue, and MSPs should guard against the tendency for governments of whatever colour, and I mean whatever colour, just, this happens to be an SNP government. I made the same points actually in the Labour Liberal uh, administration. From using legislation like this to curtail Parliament's proper power to amend legislation. The role of Parliament is to ensure that on major issues of legislation, the government gets it right. If Parliament loses its power to amend major legislation, as it will in the keeping pace power, then we are indeed on a slippery slope. So I hope that in two weeks' time, when we look at stage three amendments to the continuity bill, the Scottish Government accepts that there are issues with what some people have called Henry VIII's powers in these two very small subsections of Section 4. And if the Scottish Government is willing to seek consensus in amending these two subsections, and I know that my colleague Liam MacArthur is trying to find a solution to this with the Scottish Government, I look forward to voting for the bill at stage three so that Parliament can indeed move forward together with the Government. Presiding officer, I've concentrated on the keeping pace powers, and that's what is of concern to me particularly, and I've used this opportunity to highlight that, and I'm glad the minister responsible for the bill is actually listening to this debate, and that's encouraging. Presiding officer, I've concentrated on, on the keeping pace powers, but it's just one of the five areas identified by the Finance and Constitution Committee. I look forward to hearing the contribution of other members about the other four areas. Thank you very much. I now call on Gordon Lindhurst to speak on behalf of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee, <coughs> to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This debate is about a new post-Brexit world in which our committees will have new challenges. We must take time to consider our approach, but not too much time. I am therefore pleased to take part in this debate on behalf of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee. I would like to thank members of the Finance and Constitution Committee for their diligent work and initiating this debate. Whilst Finance and Constitution Committee's letter raised important constitutional issues, I will limit my comments to just a few of the questions it set out. Three key points highlighted by my committee, consultation, transparency, and time. Eisenhower said, and I quote, I assure you that it is our desire and intention to keep the doors of consultation always and fully open. There must never be a final word between friends. Eisenhower was highlighting an important point, the need for consultation and transparency, and of course, of having friends. One of the key principles of this parliament is that it should be open and encourage participation. Eisenhower was right that the doors of consultation should be open. The committee believes that any policy making process, including in areas previously subject to EU law, should be subject to consultation of those affected by the policy. Explained by the famous constitutionalist and author Mont Montesquieu, and I quote, pour devenir vraiment grand, il faut se tenir avec les gens, pas au dessus d'eau. And for the benefit of my colleague, Graham Simpson, who may be listening in, I translate to English. To become truly great, one has to stand with people, not above them. 
So there should be clear and transparent processes for facilitating consultation engagement. The need for engagement of those affected applies to many areas of post-Brexit policymaking, including common frameworks. The committee would expect both governments to consult on common frameworks and responses to consultation should be published. Changes to common frameworks as a result of consultation should be made clear to the lead committee. This would help committees to gauge the response to the framework and plan their scrutiny. Committees need time for scrutiny. The committee believes that information and timescales on forthcoming common frameworks should be made available well before they are referred to committees. The Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee, like most committees, has a very full work programme and would require notice to scrutinise common frameworks. The protocol produced for scrutiny of Brexit-related subordinate legislation dealt with at Westminster was helpful in setting out the parameters of scrutiny. In most cases, the timescale set out in the protocol has been adhered to. However, if common frameworks cover wider, more complex matters, adequate time must be given for proper scrutiny of them. Our committee has been liaising with its counterpart at Westminster. Time is needed so that the possibility of joint working can be explored where appropriate. Some common frameworks are likely to be highly technical in nature, and many of the Brexit-related UK statutory instruments considered by the committee already fall into that category. Consideration should be given to developing a sifting process to enable committees to have a proper perspective on scrutiny work they carry out on frameworks. Resource-wise, we note the additional work already welling up from increased volumes of Brexit-related subledge referred to committee. I would like to put on record my thanks to SPICE officials for excellent briefings when provided often on challenging timescales in relation to these items. Increase to the work arising for committees from such matters requires proper resources. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, consultation, transparency, and time are all key ingredients of good policy making and scrutiny. At this time of change, these three things should be uppermost in the minds of the UK and Scottish governments. Thank you very much. I now call on Ruth Maguire on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee to be followed by Gillian Martin. Presiding officer, if I could begin by congratulating the Finance and Constitution Committee in securing this significant debate. Like many other committees, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee has been cited on Brexit and how it might affect the areas within its remit since the committee was established in 2016. We've worked hard over the last four years to bottom out these issues, so we have a clearer view of what, meaning the EU, of what leaving the EU means for the protection and advancement of equal opportunities and human rights in Scotland. Our early work identified the main risks. At the end of any transition period, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights ceases to apply across the UK. Our report, Getting Rights Right, Human Rights and the Scottish Parliament, looked at the importance of the Charter. The Charter brings the fundamental rights of everyone living in the EU into an overarching human rights framework. It includes the Convention rights, some in updated form, as well as additional specific rights not in the Convention, such as certain social and economic rights which the UK has agreed to guarantee either in EU law or other international treaties. The Charter was designed to permit development of new rights and new means of protecting rights. These benefits are lost when the Charter can no longer be relied on in the UK courts. It's crucial to keep up to date with human rights to ensure they're not being eroded in Scotland and opportunities to enhance protections are grasped by the government of the day. Our current government has committed to the creation of a new statutory human rights framework for Scotland in the next parliamentary session. Developments in this area will need to be closely monitored. This will require stakeholders to help the committee with this task to ensure three things. Number one, that there is no regression from rights previously guaranteed by membership of the European Union. Two, that Scotland keeps pace with future rights developments within the European Union and three, that leadership in human rights continues to be demonstrated. 
Moving on to the equalities part of our remit, being out of the EU means there will be no ability to seek the opinion of the European Court of Justice. It is notable that many of the decisions made by the European Court of Justice have been influential in expanding and improving our equality legislation. Equal treatment legislation has been defined as a policy area where no common framework is required. It bans discrimination and harassment in employment on the grounds of sex, race, age, disability, sexual orientation and religion or belief. It also bans discrimination in the provision of services on the grounds of sex and race and requires the existence of an Equalities Monitoring Board, such as the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Many of these aspects are reserved, however devolved competence intersects with EU equal treatment legislation through the government's role to act to encourage equal opportunities. Therefore, this area will remain a key focus for the committee to monitor at EU level and how the Scottish Government works with the UK Government. In summing up, Presiding Officer, the committee sees a sizeable task ahead of it. Much of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee's scrutiny on Brexit during this and the coming parliamentary session will focus on the keeping pace power. As such, the committee agrees that the matter of whether the Parliament should be dependent on the Scottish Government in identifying what might or might not be suitable for the keeping pace power is an important consideration. The committee asks for early engagement in the policy development process. Before coming to a close, I'd like to briefly touch on two emerging issues in an Equalities and Human Rights Committee we'd have to grapple with. The UK internal market and trade deals. There is currently limited information on how these policy areas will affect equalities and human rights, but we note that there is potential for them to do so. Therefore, we know work will be required to establish the extent of which this will impact on the committee's remit. Finally, presiding officer, like other speakers have mentioned, we recognise that additional work comes at a cost. Our experience when human rights was added to our remit raised concerns from stakeholders that the committee would not cope with the increased workload and areas of the remit could become neglected. Although we have managed that test, I do not feel so certain that the committee would cope with another increase in its workload unless additional clerking and resource, uh, research resources were made available. On that note, I will end my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call in Gillian Martin on behalf of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, President Officer. The Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee has played a substantial part in parliamentary scrutiny of EU exit matters to date. We were the secondary uh, committee reporting in part one of the UK withdrawal from the European Union Bill and we have also undertaken a considerable degree of work in relation to common frameworks a significant amount of Brexit-related statutory instruments, as well as the environmental implications of the UK Agriculture Bill, the UK Fisheries Bill. And we also considered the legisl Legislative Consent Memorandum for the UK Environment Bill. This scrutiny will not end with the end of the transition, far from it. During the Committee's evidence taking on the Withdrawal Bill, concerns were expressed around opportunity for parliamentary scrutiny, um, when the Scottish Government would and would not decide to uh, exercise its powers and align its policies to EU law. EU, EU, EU environmental standards are now a policy and lawmaking process which is, does not include any involvement of UK and Scottish interests, but which members on the whole believe have improved environmental standards in Scotland over the years of membership and are an important benchmark for the future, particularly as the UK makes its own trade deals out with the EU. We don't believe it's practical or realistic for a parliamentary committee to have a role in relation to continually monitoring the EU policy-making process within its remit. For one thing, the committee does not have sufficient capacity to forensically monitor the EU policy-making landscape. However, we did recommend the withdrawal bill be amended to require the Scottish Government to report on a regular basis to Parliament on developments in EU environmental law. We also recommended that the government include information about whether it intends to or not use the keeping pace power to align with each development and whether it's decided not to align to provide reasons for that decision. It's essential for committees to have a complete understanding of how the EU exit process impacts on the governance and constitutional landscape within their policy area. And for that, we believe the capacity within the Scottish Parliament Research Centre, the clerking teams and legal services should be enhanced accordingly. 
The committee expressed serious concern at the impact of the Brexit process on the operation of the devolution settlement in its report on the Legislative Consent Memorandum in the UK Environment Bill and its Stage 1 report. We subsequently outlined our serious concerns on the consequences of the, uh, the Internal Market Bill proposals on the operation of the devolution settlement. As Bruce Crawford mentioned, we have concerns, serious concerns, around the Emissions Trading Scheme framework. We had anticipated scrutinising the rel related framework before the end of 2020, but recent suggestions that this framework may longer be progressed and may be in fact replaced by a carbon emissions tax by the UK government is deeply worrying. And this issue is a microcosm of our general serious concerns about the process of development and agreement of UK-wide frameworks, including the fundamental issue of effectively ignoring the views of devolved governments and parliaments. This also highlights the impact of decisions made in UK policy having a potentially detrimental impact on devolved ambition for particular climate change. Other UK common frameworks seem nowhere near the state of completion we would have expected by this 11th hour, and we highlighted significant concerns about being asked to consider legislative elements of frameworks without the sight of re the related framework. To date, we have very little information about the timetabling of frameworks, which makes it also difficult for us to protect space in our work programme for parliamentary scrutiny. These frameworks will have to be monitored by this parliament well beyond the end of the transition. And we note that any scrutiny of this issue is likely to be very technical and complex. As the UK makes trade agreements, the committee agrees that where aspects of a trade agreement relate to devolved competence, the Scottish Parliament should also be able to scrutinise the Scottish Government's position. We also have a role in scrutinising the new Environmental Standards Scotland. Indeed, we met the board, uh, the board nominees this morning. And as they, they issue improvement notices, Parliament will need the tools to scrutinise those decisions too. As everyone here is aware, it takes a collaboration of clerks, researchers and legal services for these issues to be adequately scrutinised by members. And I want to put on my record to my thanks, uh, my thanks to the clerks of the Committee for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and our researchers who have put in a power of work to assist us through this process and beyond. Effective scrutiny also takes a substantial amount of time. The impact of the UK exit from the EU represents a significant challenge to the Scottish Parliament's scrutiny function. To meet this challenge, we must be sufficiently resourced both in time and expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Joan McAlpine on behalf of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee to be followed by Bill Bowman. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I begin also by thanking Bruce Crawford and the Finance and Constitution Committee for embarking on this process, consulting other committees and securing this very important debate. This debate is timely, with 23 days until we leave the regulatory framework of the customs union and single market. In addition, there are specific arrangements for Northern Ireland, operational detail of which is not yet entirely clear given today's developments regarding the protocol. However, all the evidence suggests that the, there will be a border in the Irish Sea. That the future relationship between the EU and UK government remains so unclear on the cusp of the transition period ending and in the middle of a global pandemic is quite astonishing. Presiding Officer, I am speaking this afternoon as Convener of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee. The committee, with the exception of our two Conservative members, agreed our response to the letter from the Convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee, and it is the issues raised in that letter that I will address here today. Presiding Officer, membership of the European Union formed a key pillar underpinning the devolution settlements in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The process of leaving the European Union necessitates the restructuring of the territorial governance of the UK. The European Union has an open, democratic decision-making process, which allows for stakeholder engagement and relies upon the democratic consent of Member States and the European Parliament. The critical governance question for the UK is what similar democratic processes will be put in place post-Brexit that provides for decision-making that is not confined just to governmental actors. To this end, the committee has highlighted a number of key principles drawn from the operation of the European Union, which we consider should inform the territorial governance 
in the UK post-Brexit. The principles are transparency, consent, trust and respect for existing constitutional arrangements for jurisdictions, including Scotland, that are subject to so-called internal market provisions. The Internal Market Bill currently being considered at Westminster will, as currently drafted, significantly constrain the exercise of devolved competences by this Parliament, with some of our witnesses uh, pointing, that, pointing out that some pieces of legislation covering even devolved areas what may be impossible to effectively enforce. In addition, the committee considers that while the Internal Market Bill seeks to appropriate the language of the European single market, the substance of the bill lacks the checks and balances that are central to the operation of the European single market. In particular, the bill lacks the principles of proportionality and subsidiarity, as well as what are known as flanking measures which seek to ensure that wider social, environmental and public policy objectives are, where appropriate, able to constrain the operation of the market. These vital checks and balances are all absent from the UK Government's proposals for an internal market. The committee emphasised that robust governance mechanisms alongside opportunities for genuine debate and scrutiny, including with individuals and non-governmental actors, are essential and central to the operation of the EU single market. These governance mechanisms are absent from the UK Government proposals. The Committee also highlights the potential for trade agreements to impact on devolved competencies. At present, there are very limited formal powers to scrutinise these arrangements for the UK Parliament and no formal role at all for the Scottish Parliament. The committee has taken evidence from trade experts, including former international trade negotiators, who observed that the complex nature of modern trade agreements requires that legislatures and stakeholders should be engaged at an early stage, ideally before a negotiating mandate has been agreed. Expert witnesses consistently stressed that non-tariff barriers are as important, if not more important, uh, than, uh, as an area of scrutiny than tariffs. This will represent a new area of scrutiny for the Scottish Parliament and therefore raises a series of resource challenges for the next session of Parliament. Presiding officer, the committee also emphasises that tracking progress of EU legislation, which the Scottish Government decides to keep pace with, and indeed not to keep pace with, will also represent a significant scrutiny challenge in the next session of Parliament. Lastly, presiding officer, the committee notes that the process of Brexit will not conclude following the end of transition. In many respects, the end of transition marks only the beginning of the process of Brexit. Leaving in a no-deal scenario may leave EU-UK relations in a negative place in the short term, whilst even with a deal, there will be a substantial process of adaptation and change. Scrutiny of this is ongoing and no doubt evolving relationship between the EU and UK and the implications for the devolution settlement will be a challenge. In, con in conclusion, presiding officer, the process of Brexit has exposed the weakness of democratic safeguards which operate in the UK once the regulatory framework provided by the EU is removed. The implications of Brexit are profound for the devolution settlement and the committee stresses that they are likely to be particularly acute in the months following the end of transition. The committee has sought to emphasise a set of principles which can underpin the devolution settlement post-Brexit and which have been central to our membership of the EU. I therefore welcome the opportunity this debate has provided to begin to explore on a cross-committee basis what the implications of Brexit will be for devolution. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Bill Bowman to speak on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. He'll be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate as convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Can I too thank the Finance and Constitution Committee for bringing this debate forward this afternoon? Before I turn to the specifics of what we are here to discuss, it is perhaps helpful for those out with this place and to remind those within that one of the key roles of my committee is to scrutinise primary legislation, be that Scottish Government bills, members' bills, or via legislative consent memorandums, UK bills, which confer powers on Scottish ministers. 
Essentially, we are here to advise the Parliament whether it is right to give powers to Scottish ministers to legislate in the future, often with no end date. And if it is appropriate, what level of future scrutiny should this Parliament have on the exercise of such powers? Now, this is a role the committee takes very seriously. Indeed, the Delegated Powers Committee are the purists on scrutiny. Regardless of subject or policy, we believe that members of the Parliament must have the opportunity to scrutinise secondary legislation at the appropriate time and at the appropriate level. This must balance the amount of delegation with the practicalities of running an administration as well as the risks of ministers of whatever government being unchecked in what they do. The committee also takes great pride in looking at the questions posed by legislative scrutiny in a collegiate fashion, a little as Anna Sarwar commented on earlier. Indeed, all the committee's recommendations on the scrutiny of legislation relating to EU exit were agreed unanimously. Now, that is not to say we do not have lively discussions. We always seek to get to the heart of an issue. Rather, it is because we have a shared desire to protect the Parliament's scrutiny role, both for this and for any future government. It is in that light that I turn to the substance of the debate. The committee has been considering UK government bills in light of the UK leaving the EU for a number of years, from the initial EU withdrawal bill, with withdrawal agreement bill, to the current internal market bill. The committee's common theme in its scrutiny of each of these UK bills is that the Scottish Parliament should have the opportunity to effectively scrutinise the exercise of all legislative powers within devolved competence. The committee also considers, as a minimum, that all powers under these bills exercisable by UK ministers in devolved areas should be subject to the process set out in the new statutory instrument protocol. This covers powers exercised by UK ministers in devolved areas arising from EU withdrawal. Now, this is the third protocol the Parliament and Scottish Government have developed since the UK voted to leave the EU. These protocols have already been referred to uh, earlier this afternoon. Each has been jointly agreed to help ensure effective and proportionate scrutiny of legislation. While they may not make front page news, they have ensured some vitally important checks and balances in the Parliament's scrutiny function and should be applauded. Some earlier contributors have also raised the keeping pace power in the current UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Scotland Bill. In its stage one report, the committee highlighted that primary legislation is the most appropriate vehicle for keeping pace with significant new policy developments in future EU law that have no equivalent in EU retained law. The committee looked at the bill again today as amended at stage two and will report shortly. In closing, Deputy Presi oh, sorry, Presiding Officer, <laughs> um, I'm grateful for this time granted to speak in the debate. And can I take this opportunity to thank my fellow members of the committee, both past and present, for their excellent work. Each of us on the committee wants to ensure that the Parliament continues to have a proper scrutiny role for both today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we enter the open part of the debate. I call John Mason to be followed by Donald Cameron. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, clearly in this debate we are looking at specific pieces of legislation, such as the Continuity Bill and the UK's Internal Market Bill. We are also thinking ahead to trade negotiations with other countries as well as to common frameworks within the UK and how all of these will develop over time. But if I could start with some more general points, I think there are some wider and deeper issues too about what does Parliament's scrutiny function actually mean. I looked up scrutiny in the dictionary and it showed up words like a searching study, inquiry, inspection, examination, a searching look, a close watch. So here we, are with the minority, with, here we are with the minority government, and all of us have responsibilities if we are not in government as well. Parliament, including the committees, must scrutinise government, and then again, both the Scottish Government and Parliament must scrutinise the Westminster Government. Related to that is the fact that the Westminster Parliament, where we all have colleagues, should be scrutinising the Westminster Government too. It seems to me that scrutinising does not mean automatically supporting or automatically opposing either government. We all have party affiliations and loyalties. However, if we are to fulfil our role of scrutiny, I think to some extent we need to draw a distinction in our minds between our responsibilities to our parties and our responsibilities to whichever parliament we are members of. Personally, I think it is more important than whether we have one chamber or two chambers. Both are perfectly acceptable means of scrutiny, and there are examples of both around the world. 
But we have to be prepared to scrutinise governments, even if we are in the same party as them, and that will certainly include questioning and challenging them. Moving on to some of the more specific issues that we face, I was particularly interested in the section of the FCC Committee letter of 30th October on governance. It makes the point that the EU had a range of institutions in place, including the European Commission and European Court of Justice. Of course, we did not always agree with or like the decisions of these bodies, but they were broadly seen to be independent and not under the influence of one particular government or country. Now we have new bodies being set up, including the Office of the Internal Market and the Trade Remedies Authority. I remain a little unclear, I have to say, what the relationship is exactly between the Office of the Internal Market and the Competition and Markets Authority. Time will tell how these bodies develop and how they relate to the devolved governments and parliaments. But the concern has to be about how independent they truly will be and whether they will be unduly influenced by the UK government. We continue to have the fundamental weakness in the UK of having no written constitution and therefore there being no real way for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to challenge UK government legislation and UK institutions in the, court, in the courts in the way that with a proper federal system, the states in the US or Lander in Germany have ultimately got legal rights where the courts, which the courts will protect. I think our experience of UK institutions like HMRC or OBR is patchy and can depend on particular office holders, whether they treat the devolved administrations seriously or not. But it should not depend on the goodwill of individuals. There need to be solid principles and requirements in place, for example, the TRA laying its reports directly in Parliament and not just with the Scottish Government. When we come to common frameworks, I think there was concern from a number of committees that these should be widely consulted on and committees, presumably in all four parliaments, should have sufficient time to influence them before they are finalised. It certainly remains a concern of mine that informal agreements are made over the phone between ministers with minimal input from anyone else. I think that happened to some extent with the Scottish fiscal framework and that does not inherently have to be a bad thing and can actually break log jams in negotiations. However, the inevitable downside if that happens is that there is less scrutiny and less parliamentary involvement. I thought the REC committee response on this was good, and I quote from it, the introduction of common frameworks could represent a shift towards a greater degree of intergovernmental decision-making where the scrutiny role of parliaments is significantly diminished. And I thought the Eclair committee response was helpful, sharing some of their experiences. The example of emissions trading scheme framework is concerning if everyone is moving ahead in good faith when suddenly the UK government decides to take a completely different line, in this case with a carbon emissions tax. It is not so much the actual decision that concerns me in this case as the way it has been carried out. In this regard, where potentially all parliaments are to some extent excluded by all governments, I think we should be looking at doing more joint working with committees in the other three places. And the Economy Committee mentions interacting with their counterpart committee in the House of Commons, which is good. On trade deals, we did hear evidence that the provinces in Canada are heavily involved all the way through the process, so it clearly can be done if there is a requirement and a willingness for that to happen. So in conclusion, overall, I think this has been a helpful process. I think the Finance and Constitution Committee is grateful for the considered input from the other committees, and clearly this is a topic we need to keep a focus on, both in the new year and in the new Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Mason. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Keith Brown. Donald Cameron. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to contribute in this debate uh, for the Scottish Conservatives. I'd like to note uh, early on that the letter from the Finance and Constitution Committee that was sent to consult other committees to hear their views on uh, the future scrutiny role of this Parliament was sent before uh, the current pandemic occurred, and therefore the COVID-19 committee that I convened uh, has not had an opportunity to participate in this. Naturally, we all hope that the pandemic will be over as soon as possible and that it will not be a long-term need for uh, the COVID-19 committee, and I don't speak tonight uh, as that convener. But I would like to comment briefly on the work of the committee, because in my view, it does show the strength of the Parliament in terms of innovating where necessary in response 
to events. Recently, the COVID-19 committee has had some challenges uh, in working out exactly how that committee scrutinizes emergency legisla legislation, given the timeframes of made affirmative legislation. But I hope we have now reached uh, the correct position that we are able to scrutinize these uh, changes uh, in, say, restriction levels in the weeks that they happen in terms of COVID restrictions that apply nationally. I accept the COVID-19 committee's remit has very little to do with Brexit, but as I've said, it is an example of the Scottish Parliament adapting and creating an effective scrutiny mechanism. And I commend the Scottish Government for its input in that, but I would state that it is for Parliament, not Government, to determine uh, the correct procedures. As John Mason has just said, um, that applies as much to Westminster as it does to Holyrood, and it is also regardless of political affiliation. Moving on, I will try to give some more general observations on this matter, having listened carefully to what other members have been saying. And I was especially um, uh, impressed by the many measured contributions from the various conveners of subject committees. Many of them made the point about resources. Uh, and I think that if anything, uh, the, both government and parliament need to take that point away from tonight's debate. I don't intend to add much to what others have said about the actual politics of the UK's exit from the EU. That is well-trodden ground. And as Anna Sawa said, it is not for today. Um, in, in terms of various issues to cover, um, I'd firstly like to turn to the keeping pace issues uh, that both Dean Lockhart and Mike Rumbles have noted. They raise issues about the continuity bill. And Bruce Crawford too uh, made the point that um, there is no democratic input now following Brexit into EU policymaking, combined with fewer limits on ministerial discretion. Um, in my view, any Scottish parliamentarian should be concerned by that combination. Uh, members have spoke about common frameworks, and in my view, there's also bound to be disagreement about common frameworks. We've heard from both Graham Day and Gillian Martin about disputes over uh, the emissions common framework. But only this morning in the Health Committee, uh, we saw an example of a common framework working well. The Scottish Government themselves, the minister attending, commended all four nations for the work that they had put in on the common framework in relation to food labelling. So I would say that common frameworks can work well. And there are examples of all the devolved administrations coordinating and collaborating quickly and effectively. The next point I'd like to cover is uh, trade deals, which some uh, members have also spoken about. Um, I know from the Finance and Constitution Committee's convener's letter inviting input that it had concerns about the role of the government in future trade deals. And Bruce Crawford made the argument that the SNP government could, and I quote, assist the UK government in the formulation, negotiation, and implementation of policy relating to the regulation of international trade issues regarding devolved matters. Um, that's a fair remark, uh, and a number of members have made the same point tonight, including Gillian Martin and Joe McAlpine. But it has to be balanced against the fact that as a matter of law, this is a reserved area, and that the UK government has already secured new trade deals, many of which will benefit Scotland. For instance, UK government signed a free trade agreement with Japan, which goes beyond Japan's agreement with the EU, meaning that 99% of UK exports will be free of tariffs. Part of that agreement included the protection of more UK geographical indicators than was previously agreed under the EU-Japan deal, including the protection of Scottish products like Stornoway Black Pudding, Scotch Beef and Shetland Wool for the first time ever in Japan. Now, in my view, that's been of undisputable benefit to Scotland. I want to briefly turn to some of the comments made by the Health Committee in their letter to the Finance and Constitution Committee, because it's an example of day-to-day -day interaction between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament in terms of scrutiny. One of the criticisms that the Health and Sport Committee made was how the Scottish Government has engaged with that committee on the consideration of statutory instrument notifications. And it said there have been several occasions where such notifications um, have led to the committee having to seek further information and clarification on what that particular statutory instrument is trying to achieve. And we've required this additional information before the committee can take 
an informed decision and there aren't either the timescales set out in the protocol to scrutinize the proposal. Now, that might be a technical issue, but it's about scrutiny and how it works in reality. Um, to conclude, presiding officer, I hope the Scottish Government takes note of all the points that have made have been made. This has been a largely consensual debate. There are clearly differing views on Brexit, the Internal Market Bill, Continuity Bill. The fact remains we have a real challenge in the years ahead for the Scottish Parliament to scrutinise uh, government. And I repeat the point I've made. That is for Parliament to determine and not government to make those decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cameron. And I call Keith Brown to be followed by James Kelly. Keith Brown. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this important debate, and I was both surprised and pleased to hear the reference from Gordon Lindhurst to uh, Montesquieu, the French liberal thinker. First of all, I thought it was just the usual Tory obsession with barons and baronesses. But then I realised, of course, um, he's best known for his theory on the separation of powers, and that's very appropriate to, to this debate. Although it's worth noting that the Westminster establishment has never been too keen on the separation of powers. If you think about the position of the Lord Chancellor, um, was both head of the judiciary, uh, head of the House of Lords in the legislature, and sat in the executive and cabinet. So I think this debate and this discussion does really bear on where power should properly lie. As the UK leaves the EU against the wishes of the overwhelming majority of people in Scotland, it is crucial that the Parliament, this Parliament and the other devolved legislatures develop their role in response to the evolving circumstances to ensure continued scrutiny of the creation and ongoing operation of common frameworks in the UK, as well as how to engage with the negotiation of any new international agreements by the UK Government. While many consequences of Brexit can be expected to impact on Scotland without directly affecting the devolution settlement, such as, for example, the very regrettable end of freedom of movement, there are equally as many areas which will impact on the competencies of this Parliament, such as food safety, as we've heard, public procurement and environmental standards. It's therefore right, as you've heard, that the Parliament's committees have considered the Parliament's evolving scrutiny in the context of the impact of Brexit on devolution. This Parliament's ability to scrutinise and either consent to or disagree with legislation proposed by the UK Government, which impacts on matters devolved to this Parliament, is at the heart of the devolution settlement. And members of the Parliament will be aware of the Seoul Convention, which is laid out in section 28.8 of the Scotland Act in 1998. That states, it's recognised that the Parliament of the United Kingdom will not normally legislate with regard to devolved matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Members will also be aware that during the passage of the EU Withdrawal Bill, the UK Government sought consent from this Parliament in line with the Seoul Convention, and they will recall this Parliament voted overwhelmingly to refuse that consent. The UK Government then took an unprecedented decision and for the first time since devolution chose to continue with the Bill and legislate for matters within or affecting the responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament without its agreement. Since then, this Parliament has also refused consent for the Internal Market Bill. Again, the UK Government has turned its back on the Seoul Convention in a move which can only be seen as an attack on devolution, a move that will allow Westminster to undermine democratic decisions made by this Parliament, which could force Scotland to accept standards set by Westminster in devolved policy areas like public health measures, the environment and food, food safety, a move that even the House of Lords could not condone. And it's worth remembering back in 2014, we were told this would be the most powerful devolved parliament in the world. And then we saw Lord Keane in the, court, uh, the Supreme Court arguing that the Seoul Convention was merely a self-denying ordinance. As we've heard from the conveners, the committees of this parliament have identified a number of areas worthy of note. And I'm particularly drawn to the principles that the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee feel we should underpin governance in the UK post-Brexit. Transparency, consent, trust and respect for existing constitutional arrangements for jurisdictions that are subject to internal market provisions. Certainly not what the UK Government has demonstrated thus far. The submissions from committees highlighted several common areas, such as monitoring EU developments in devolved policy areas, which may or may not be kept pace with. Given that such monitoring has previously been done at UK level, there was a consensus that this would be a challenging task, which the Parliament and its committees would not currently have the capacity to perform. The importance of building in sufficient time for parliamentary scrutiny and wider engagement with stakeholders and those affected by the policy proposals in question. This will be challenging given what are already very busy workloads. Increased workloads could be expected for colleagues in clerking teams, in spice and legal services as a result of the consequences of Brexit. And Bruce Crawford quite rightly made the point that the resources need to be made available to support 
the requirement for increased scrutiny. Those are resources not just for members of this parliament, but also for those that support the work of the parliament. And it's very important, I think, that the parliament takes that on board as soon as possible. Uh, to conclude, uh, President Officer, the content and operation of any common framework or trade agreements will undoubtedly have very important implications for Scotland. The crucial point is they should not be imposed. The respect of different parliaments having different powers should be what underlines the approach to this in all different um, parliaments uh, and legislatures across the UK. Uh, they must be developed in partnership and agreed, and it's vital that moving forward, this parliament is fully involved and has a strong and effective scrutiny role to ensure that we work in the interests of Scotland, as well as the interests of those other parliaments where we're talking about their powers. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Brown. And I call James Kelly to be followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you, presiding officer. The, the issue that's been brought before us by the Finance and Constitution Committee is the one of scrutiny uh, for devolutionary powers post-Brexit. And there can be no doubt that the massive transfer of powers that's going to take place is going to transform the devolution la landscape. And in that respect, uh, it's absolutely crucial that there is a proper and constructive working relationship between the UK and the Scottish governments. And in my submission, I want to argue that both have uh, got more work to do. Uh, I'll draw on two legislative examples and make two political points. Uh, in terms of the legislation, I think if you look at the UK Internal Market Bill, which has been referenced substantially throughout this afternoon's debate, there are two particular problems with it in terms of the Tories' uh, government's approach to the Scottish Parliament. First of all, by setting up an office of the internal market to e effectively dictate standards uh, throughout the different devolution aspects of the United Kingdom. Uh, it overrides the, some of the powers of the Parliament and you know, doesn't respect the, the views of different parts of the United Kingdom. I think added to that, the other problem is that there's not a proper arbitration process uh, to settle disputes. Clearly, with the significant transfer of powers that we're going to see, there will be disputes and disagreements, um, but the UK Internal Market Bill in no other format has, uh, has been set uh, to settle those disputes. Uh, and uh, as long as that continues, we're going to have you know, serious problems. I think in terms of the continuity bill, uh, which has been brought forward by the government in this parliament, as Mike Rumble's uh, highlighted, there's a problem currently with the, the balance between the powers conferred on ministers and the powers of the parliament vis-a-vis uh, -vis committees. Uh, and I think there needs to be a redress in that regard. I think a number of the conveners have made important points, uh, not only about resources for committees, but also how the government interacts with, that, with, with, with the committees. And for that to happen, uh, you know, for, for it to work, then there needs to be a greater interaction. Uh, in terms of some of the wider political points, uh, I mean, I think the Tories, I have to say, have run into real difficulty in regard to their approach to devolution. Um, they, they, they've been on a, a, a journey uh, on devolution. Obviously, the, their party opposed devolution and the setting up of the Scottish Parliament. But to be fair, um, I've seen many uh, Conservative MSPs make genuine and sincere speeches uh, in support of the Scottish Parliament and support of devolution. However, recently that was trashed by Boris Johnson's comments that he regarded devolution as being a disaster. Uh, I mean, I understand he, he made the comments on a a Zoom call. Um, there's no doubt after that he's, you know, he'd be known as, as Zoomer Johnson because he basically threw the Tories uh, under a bus. All the all the work that the Conservatives, Scottish Conservatives, have genuinely done to interact with the devolution process um, has been trashed, and it will it will tarnish and it will damage the, the, the Scottish Conservatives in the period going going forward. 
I think in terms of the subject of this afternoon's debate, uh, Graham Day, the Minister at the start, said that uh, in relation to parliamentary scrutiny, there was nothing more central to the role of Parliament. And John Mason said that he had looked up the word scrutiny in a dictionary um, before the debate to, you know, to learn a bit about it. I, I would suggest that the government themselves uh, need to be looking more into what scrutiny actually means. Uh, if you look at the, their attitude uh, recently, during the course of the pandemic, when I mean, the presiding officer himself has had to intervene at times because there have been statements made out with Parliament, statements made at press conferences, which should have been made in, in the Parliament. And the Parliament has not been given its proper place and it has been treated with disrespect. Allied to that, we had the instance recently in terms of the Alex Salmond inquiry where twice we've had debates uh, requesting that legal advice be provided by the government and twice the, the government have not accepted the vote of parliament. If you're going to have that attitude to scrutiny, then instead of coming out to these debates, we would all be better just going for a run around Holyrood Park. So the government needs to, to, to learn more and work, work uh, more stringently on this. So summing up, uh, presiding officer, there are big issues for scrutiny uh, post-Brexit. Um, I think there's a lot that the UK government has to do to try and repair the damage of Boris Johnson's comments and also the, the legislation on the UK Internal Market Bill. And I also think the Scottish government needs to be more serious if they want us to believe that they truly are interested in scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kelly. And I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Annie Wills. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm pleased um, to see that the Parliament and uh, its uh, committees evidently continue to have such a healthy and positive interest in scrutiny uh, um, uh, on show today. Since it, it reconvened in 1999 after its unduly long adjournment, this Parliament has had to adjust its working practices and scrutiny mechanisms to cope with many new external realities. In all that time, however, perhaps nothing has represented the kind of threat to the Parliament and its powers as the UK's internal market bill has. That is one of the reasons, I think, why uh, it is right that the Finance and Constitution Committee has been working with the Parliament's other committees, um, from whom we have heard today, to look at the impact uh, of Brexit on devolution and, inseparable, in my view, from that issue, uh, also why the Scottish Parliament uh, and, more importantly, Scotland needs the Continuity Bill. The Continuity Bill, uh, Presiding Officer, does not pretend bravely that Brexit has somehow not really happened that it was perhaps all just a very bad dream. It starts from the sober realisation that the people of Scotland's views on Brexit, as on so many other things, uh, feature only marginally in the thinking of the UK government, and that the Scottish government's approach to that situation also recognises um, that almost anything could still happen in the Brexit talks currently underway in Brussels. We all realise um, that it could still now be just 23 sleeps till a no-deal Brexit, a prospect which some in the UK government seem to have been open to, indeed perhaps festive about at various stages in recent weeks, despite all that it would mean for our economy in the midst of a global pandemic. So faced with all of those issues and threats, the Continuity Bill, uh, Presiding Officer, seeks to give this Parliament the ability not just to scrutinise, important as that is, the huge changes before us, but also to ensure a continuity of provision that would otherwise be lost on withdrawal from the EU. At its most basic, um, it would guarantee that after New Year's Day, those devolved areas previously subject to EU regulation will continue to be re regulated on and indeed scrutinised in Scotland as a matter of stable good governance. Secondly, in those parts of the law where the subject matter may pertain to an area within devolved competence, the Bill offers this Parliament the chance to ensure that EU law is kept pace, with, kept pace with, if that is this Parliament's wish. Such a power to adopt EU measures is, in my view, the best way to ensure the ongoing productive relationship with Europe that our businesses want 
as well as to maintain the high environmental standards that our farming and other industries demand. Like the previous continuity bill passed by this Parliament but blocked by the UK Government, the bill contains a power for Scottish Ministers, with the approval of this Parliament, to align devolved Scots law with the laws with those in the European Union. It will also help us live up to our commitments on the environment, as others have pointed out, whatever pressures may come from elsewhere for us to do otherwise. All of that said, um, the Finance and Constitution Committee and the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee have both highlighted uh, their concerns about the way in which the UK Internal Market Bill will seek to impact uh, on not just the bill, but of course uh, on this Parliament's ability to scrutinise legislation. So it is important in my view, presiding officer, and I'm far from alone in believing this, um, that it is for the Scottish uh, Parliament to be in the driving seat of the debate ahead of us uh, 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 in the context of Europe. And we are certainly now in uncharted waters. This Parliament must now contend with the Prime Minister, who is on record as saying that it matters not one jot to him what the Scottish Parliament has to say, who claims rather intriguingly that he believes Scotland doesn't have a border, who says that public money is best not spent in Strathclyde, and describes the very idea of devolution itself as a disaster. This is not a Prime Minister with which this Parliament can easily do business. But we will try, presiding officer, and the committee's efforts today are an attempt to do so under very trying circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And I move to call Annie Wells before we move to closing speeches. Annie Wells. Thank you, presiding officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate this afternoon on the impact of Brexit on the devolution settlement. As our relationship with the European Union is set to change, which in, in turn will change how this Parliament will function in the years to come, it is right and proper that the Scottish Parliament considers this issue carefully. Therefore, I would like to thank the Finance and Constitution Committee for reaching out to other committees for views and bringing this debate before MSPs today. Having said this, presiding officer, as we look ahead to the future and envisage what kind of role we want the Scottish Parliament to play in holding the government of the day to account, it's important that we firstly take a step back to ascertain how we got here. Similar to the current circumstances in regard to Brexit, the 2014 independence referendum debate was also a time which saw change looming as to how the Scottish Parliament functions. Prior to that referendum, the Scottish Conservatives launched our plans for making the Scottish Parliament one of the most powerful devolved legislators anywhere in the world, as it rightfully should be. Among the other pro-union parties, we put our heads above the parapet and made a loud and clear case that unprecedented powers over tax and welfare should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. A powerful, energised and confident Scottish Parliament, supported by the broader framework of the United Kingdom, is a guiding principle we followed and continue to follow to this day. And now, as we prepare to exit the European Union, the functions of the Scottish Parliament are set to change once again, and it is my firm belief that they will change for the better. As parliamentarians, we should recognise this as another excellent opportunity the Scottish Parliament to grow and mature even further, as its powers are set to strengthen and expand once again as we leave the European Union. As we are set to leave the Brexit transition period at the end of this month, a whole raft of significant powers, which for years have been held and controlled by the European Union, will flow to the Scottish Parliament. Significant areas of policy, from land use, animal welfare, to air quality, are all well on their way to the Scottish Parliament, where we as MSPs can properly debate ideas, challenge opinions and scrutinise Scottish Government policy on these important matters. We can do so in the knowledge that by having the ability to make policy need these areas, we can change things for the better and make a positive difference to the lives of people across Scotland. However, presiding officer, Despite the noise and the same old rhetoric and the talk of a power grab from the usual suspects, let us not forget 
that not one single power will be taken away from the Scottish Parliament. Indeed, it's quite the opposite. The full outcry from others is also completely devoid of logic and reeks of hypocrisy. And although the SNP are highly vocal and complain about the Internal Market Bill being a power grab on the Scottish Parliament, the UK government, by the UK government, what is their proposed solution? Well, as far as I understand it, it is simple to give these powers back to the EU and let them decide how to make laws in these vital areas that impact Scots on a day-to-day -day basis. In this scenario, the Scottish Parliament and its MSPs would not get a look in, as it would end up being the EU to develop policy in a whole range of areas, some of which I have already mentioned. Take fisheries, for example. The SNP have made no secret that they would reject any new deal agreed by both the UK Government and the Member States of the EU and move to vote against it, putting their position about not backing any deal whatsoever to one side. What kind of message do they think this sends to our fishermen in Scotland's coastal communities, who for decades have been required to abide by and face adverse consequences of the EU's common fisheries policy? And that is why I remain genuinely dismayed at the SNP's current position on this matter, which seems to be complaining about the UK Government taking powers from the Scottish Parliament, yet would happily give those same powers to the EU in a heartbeat. It is vital to remember, with all these new powers coming to the Scottish Parliament, MSPs will have the power to directly influence and chat change policy in the areas where we see fit. I am afraid we simply just would not be able to do so if we were a member of the European Union. Presiding officer, as I have already mentioned, I welcome we are having this debate, as of course it is right we as MSPs discuss the impact of the UK's withdrawal from the EU on the workings of the Scottish Parliament. However, we on these benches urge the Chamber to be positive about the forthcoming changes, as it will take the Scottish Parliament to the next level by providing it with new and unprecedented powers to wield as it sees fit. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms. Wells. And we turn now to closing statements, and I call on Anna Sauer to wind up for Labour. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I think there were three um, key themes to emerge from the debate today and indeed from the committee's. Uh, letters and report. Uh, one, the role of Parliament. Uh, second, about the accountability of uh, ministers. Uh, and third, the processes for keeping pace and the role of ministers in Parliament in choosing whether or not to use uh, or keep with that pace uh, process. Uh, I think there was broad consensus on the role of committees uh, and the need to, to beef them up. Um, they need to uh, include time to scrutinise uh, and resources for supporting staff, whether that be clerk, spice, uh, or legal support for committees, and for them to be able to do that work uh, well. I think Gordon Lindhurst summed it up as consultation, transparency, uh, and time. Um, and both Ruth McGuire and Gillian Martin reflected that they don't currently believe, and I, I agree with them on this. Don't currently believe that we're currently adequately resourced or ready to be able to take up uh, that role in terms of our committees. In terms of accountability for ministers, there is no doubt that the executive and ministers are going to have significant uh, new powers uh, from this uh, process, as was noted by a number of colleagues, including uh, Dean Lockhart. And there is a challenge now about how we get the right balance, as Patrick Harvey said, between the balance of power of the parliament and the executive, and to make sure that it is parliament that is prime uh, in that, and it is for the parliament to decide the level of that scrutiny, uh, not the government. Um, so how we actually have that parliamentary accountability built in to our process, I think, is absolutely uh, crucial. And in terms of the keeping uh, pace process, um, it was, uh, I think, Mike Rumbles uh, that said that we have to get the balance right on the keeping pace uh, process. And again, it's for the parliament to be at the forefront of that, not indeed uh, for the executive or the government. Uh, many members, uh, including Bill Bowman, Joan McAlpine uh, and others, re referred to the checks and balances that are important to come from this parliament. And I reflect on what Bruce Crawford said right at the start around these checks and balances are not about what the parliamentarians are currently in this chamber. This is about checks and balances that are in place for parliamentarians for the next parliament and for future parliaments as well. And again, as Donald Cameron reflected, it is for the parliament to decide not only what that scrutiny looks like, but what the process for that scrutiny is too. Keith Brown, it raised the point about uh, the imposing of laws uh, on Scotland. Uh, he was referring to, of course, from, from Westminster, and I would agree there should be no imposition uh, of laws uh, on Scotland. Uh, but we do want to be careful that there is no imposition of laws from the EU inadvertently 
uh, through these powers uh, as well. So that's something I think we need to guard uh, against. So there are significant uh, new roles uh, for the Scottish Government to monitor EU policy developments. How that is then uh, done uh, is going to be really, really important. Um, it's up to ministers at the moment to choose uh, or not to choose to keep pace. I think that we need to have greater clarity uh, on the role of uh, committees uh, and indeed this parliament uh, in that process. We have to have democratic accountability uh, of that process uh, and the beefing up of those committees I think is absolutely crucial. Uh, but I'm going to um, finish by um, giving credit to James Kelly. Uh, I'm sure he's probably not the first person to use the J Zoomer Johnson uh, line, but we'll give him credit for being the person that came up with the uh, Zoomer Johnson line. Um, he's, of course, right to say uh, that uh, the attack on devolution um, in terms of the words spoken at the very least by the Prime Minister were uh, gravely wrong and rightly condemned by people right across uh, this parliament. Uh, he is not a natural supporter of devolution. But I think we should also accept um, that independence isn't devolution either. Um, it is a separate process to devolution too. And those that are proudly supportive of devolution uh, have to speak out and speak up for devolution um, in that process. But I'll just close, um, presiding officer, and I think fundamentally the point that was made from the debate today is there has to be a primacy for Parliament when it comes to accountability uh, and transparency. And I think it's in our collective interest, regardless of our party uh, or which party is in government, to come together to decide how that primacy for Parliament actually works uh, in practice. Thank you very much, Mr Sarwar. I call Alexander Burnett to wind up for the Conservative Party. Mr Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, care homes, small business support, NHS waiting times, tourism support, green energy targets. Uh, these are all issues I think we would all rather find ourselves talking about today. And I've noted my frustration before at having to debate constitutional points uh, when we should be focusing on protecting jobs, supporting businesses and boosting trade. Now, as my colleagues have noted, when the UK leaves the EU, Holyrood will become the most powerful devolved parliament in the world, uh, with 111 extra powers coming to the Scottish Parliament. And despite what the SNP falsely claim, not a single power will be removed from the Scottish Parliament, and we'll be exp experiencing a power surge to Scotland. But instead, the SNP want to hand these powers back to the EU by rejoining the hated common fisheries policy. But meanwhile, the UK government has introduced a bill to protect the UK internal market and strengthen the Scottish Parliament. And yet, what have the SNP done? Withdrawn and refused to work on the UK internal market bill for over a year. And I'm not sure how that approach stands up to any scrutiny. Now, as Michael Gove rightly said, this completely threatens our common frameworks program as we cautiously emerge from coronavirus and focus on our country's recovery we must consider how to bring people in the UK closer together, not to put up more barriers. But it's not just the UK government asking the SNP to work with them. Business groups have too. Caroline Fairburn, Director General of the CBI, stated preserving the integrity of the internal signal market, the economic glue binding of our four nations is essential to guard against any additional costs or barriers to doing business between different parts of the UK. And even Mike Russell has admitted the need for common frameworks across the UK in 2018, and the SNP's own white paper on separation said the UK internal market was vital, noting it will be in the interest of both countries for there to be an integrated market across Scotland and the rest of the UK. And so why are the SNP no longer working in the best interest of Scotland, and what do they have to hide, apart from the 92 million given to them to prepare, but which they have refused to show how has been spent? When Michael Gove on the 1st of November wrote to the Cabinet Secretary seeking clarification, uh, he got no detail from Mike Russell. So it's disappointing that our government is choosing to play petty politics with the Constitution, risking over half a million Scottish jobs that are linked to trade with the rest of the United Kingdom, because that is what is at stake here, 60% of our trade worth over 50 billion. And we owe it to the people of Scotland to protect these close economic ties and the jobs that rely on them. And if the SNP keep up their petty grievance with the UK government, businesses in Scotland will suffer, and so will consumers. And so after a horrendous year for thousands of people losing their loved ones, watching their businesses disappear and struggling to make ends meet, the people of Scotland are desperate for some support from their Scottish government. And I can only hope that in May, they will have a new government who will be willing to do just that. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Burnett. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Michael Russell, to wind up for the Government. Oh, point of order. I, I, I know, President Officer, we're not able to raise point of orders when people are speaking from home via virtual process, but not on one occasion during that particular contribution was the issue of scrutiny of Parliament, of government here or at Westminster raised by that member. And I hope you'll raise it with them because I think it's appropriate. Thank you, Mr Crawford. The point is noted, the, the comments, I think the member actually suffered from not being in the chamber here, but he did refer to some of the comments that were brought up during the debate. In that case, it was uh, relatively appropriate, but I'm sure your comments will be noted on the record. Can I call the Cabinet Secretary, Michael Russell? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I think the, most stick, the thing that will stick in my memory from this debate is the fact that two members, not one, Bill, uh, Bill Bowman and Keith Brown, both mentioned Montesquieu. Um, and he talked about the separation of powers, and that's where I want to start here, um, because we have to have a clarity about what we are discussing. And what we're discussing is the separation of powers, the clarity about what all the different roles are within this parliament and within our democracy. And there has to be an agreement on the respective spheres in which we work. And I have to take issue, I have to say, with uh, Donald, my friend Donald Cameron, I have to say, when he uh, said during his contribution that uh, it was not up to the Scottish Government to make proposals on these matters. In actual fact, if you look at the coronavirus legislation, it was precisely up to the Scottish Government to make proposals on those matters. What I think Donald meant to say is it's not up to the Scottish Government to decide upon these matters. It is a matter for all of us as members of this Parliament to decide on the right level of scrutiny and how it should operate. And that is the issue which many members have addressed and addressed well this afternoon. But uh, I do have a caveat about that and I will come to it in a minute. I want to commend a number of individual contributions. And I'll start with Mike Rumbles. It's so unusual for me to commend Mike Rumbles that I think this should be a red letter day. I, I disagree with him on a single profound issue in this debate, which is that uh, the use of um, uh, primary legislation should be required as the norm for taking in regulations from the EU. However, I have offered to sit down and discuss this matter with Mr. Rumbles. If he lets me finish, I will say so. I am happy to discuss that with him again. If we could find a suitable definition that narrowed down what he wishes, into the areas of significant or major change, then I would be happy to do so. I give way to Mr Rumbles. I, 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 I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I'm really heartened by what he has just said. I think there's a slight misunderstanding. He's actually not disagreeing with me at all. I'm not calling for it to be the standard practice. I'm only calling it that when we do major issues, uh, in changing the law that then primary legislation is considered. So I will take him up on his offer to come and meet him to talk it through. Cabinet Secretary. Good, I, and I hope we can get an agreement upon that matter because on the, the, the wider matter of the uh, continuity bill, I have to say that we are endeavouring to get agreement on how we take this issue forward. It is not an issue of the Scottish Government simply saying this is how we're going to do it. In fact, tomorrow morning I have a, a meeting with four MSPs from different parties about trying to find the right way to put issues into the bill. And we'll go on doing so, and I hope Mr Rumbles and I can in the end come to a conclusion. Um, but scrutiny is, of course, about securing good governance. But it's not about replacing governance. Scrutiny isn't about politics, or despite what we heard from unfor unfortunate contributions from two Conservatives. Scrutiny isn't about politics. It's, a, it's actually about, or not only a politics, it's about ensuring that politics doesn't get in the way of good governance. And we have to recognise that as we look at scrutiny and how it operates across the Parliament. But scrutiny is also indivisible. For the, from the wider issues of how we operate. And Patrick Harvey was absolutely right about that. Scrutiny cannot be separated from the power structures, nor can it be separated from the powers that we hold. And I want to come to one of those powers and one of those issues very in the conclusion of what I say in a moment, because Bruce Crawford and I are one on a major issue here. But I do want to say to the Conservatives, these are inseparable issues. You cannot defend scrutiny here but reject it elsewhere. For example, if you, if you look at the issues that are being discussed in the Internal Market Bill, you're trying to take powers away, but in actual fact here, you're suggesting that scrutiny is required uh, more than we believe it is. Scrutiny is also a function of democracy. You cannot promote democracy in this chamber and deny it elsewhere. 
as you're denying the people of Scotland the right to say how they wish to be governed. And it's also, and I take this point from Ruth Maguire, it's all, scrutiny is also about human rights. It's about the wider issues. And the UK Conservative government is trying to suppress those, for example, in, in the issues of ECHR, and also trying to stop scrutiny from judicial review. So I want to see a consistency on this matter. If there is genuinely a belief, and Anna Sarwa uh, and, and James Kelly raised this issue in terms of a belief in devolution, if there is genuinely a belief in the Scottish Parliament, then operate as if you uh, believe in it and want it to work, not have one thing elsewhere and another thing here. Try to measure up standards to suit you here, but not to suit you elsewhere. Now, I want to come to a final point that Bruce Crawford made. There was extensive discussion in the last Parliament about resources for committees and particularly for the way in which we could develop the ability of members to specialise and to understand key issues. And that was a big de debate that was connected with the question of whether or not there should be payment for conveners. There was a question about reducing the number of committees. And this issue is still here at the conclusion of this Parliament. And scrutiny would be and could be at its most effective if we recognise those linkages. The first linkage between the way in which members are pulled so far apart by trying to be on two or three committees that they cannot specialise. The resources that they need to challenge legislation in a way that is well informed. Because I know, having both been on a committee dealing with legislation on occasion and as a minister, the ministers are massively better resourced in terms of legislation than members are. And that should not be the case. We should be able to do it. And equally, if we're going to build the parliament as a parliament, and I hope we build it with all the powers of a normal parliament, if we're going to build the parliament as a parliament, then we've got to build the ability of the individual members, not just to hold the government to account, but to contribute to that wider issue of scrutiny, which is we all scrutinise each other in our desire to make sure that the governance of Scotland is as good as it possibly could be. That's the big issue. It's not been resolved, regrettably, in this Parliament. It really needs to be resolved in the next Parliament. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I call on Murdo Fraser to wind up for the Finance and Constitution Committee. Um, thank you, thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, I'm pleased to close this important debate on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee. While the impact of Brexit on the devolution settlement is something that we as a committee have been considering for some time, it's been very interesting to hear the views of other committees, given that this will impact on all of our remits to some extent. And I appreciate all the views expressed both by committee conveners and indeed by uh, other uh, representatives uh, this afternoon. Now, inevitably, uh, in the debate where uh, the word Brexit appears, there was always going to be some uh, party political comment made, uh, and that's entirely understandable. And given I'm responding on behalf of the committee, uh, I am constrained, sadly, from uh, making uh, responses in relation to any of those political comments. But I think Anna Sarwar put it very well uh, at his contribution early uh, in the debate when, when, when he said uh, that this uh, debate this afternoon was something around which we should all be able to unite, which is a discussion around how this parliament should function. So uh, I want to concentrate in my closing remarks on those aspects rather than on the uh, party political comments that were made on all sides uh, this afternoon. Now, it's clear, I think, both from the responses to the committee's letter and also from the debate this afternoon, that there are three key areas which are giving cause for concern. The first question is, the question of who will undertake monitoring of relevant policy developments at an EU level to inform decisions to keep pace with them where appropriate. And this question arises as a result of the Continuity Bill, which is expected to complete its parliamentary passage before uh, the Christmas break. And this is an issue that was referred to by a number of the conveners who spoke, by uh, Ruth Maguire on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, by Gillian Martin on behalf of the Eclair Committee, uh, and by Joan McAlpin on behalf of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee. Now, the monitoring will be a challenging task in itself, and Gillian Martin, I thought, made that point very fairly, because particularly in relation to environment, there will be a huge amount coming out of the EU that we need to keep track of. But the key question is who will decide whether or not to keep pace with specific policy developments? Some committees have suggested that the Scottish Government should be required to report on the use of this power and perhaps more importantly on the reasons underpinning its decisions. 
It's also, it has also been suggested that the Parliament and its committees should have a role in such decisions. And our Stage 1 report as a committee welcomed the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to working with the Parliament to agree a decision-making framework for future alignment with EU law. It is essential that the Parliament gives serious consideration to the level of scrutiny of the keeping pace power, which would be both appropriate and proportionate. And in his contribution, Bill Bowman, uh, on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, made uh, this point. So I look forward to greater clarity being provided on these matters when the Continuity Bill is considered at Stage 3 in a couple of weeks' time. The second overarching point relates to the need for sufficient time for parliamentary scrutiny and engagement and consultation with those stakeholders who will be most affected by the decisions. This is a point made by Gordon Lindhurst on behalf of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee in a contribution made at least partly in French, uh, and it sounded like fluent French to me. Uh, this was seen as particularly important in respect of common frameworks, which our committee has previously recommended should be agreed between the devolved administrations and the UK government. However, it is equally important that common frameworks are not effectively imposed on the Parliament and stakeholders without meaningful consultation and an opportunity to discuss or propose amendments. And I hope that both of Scotland's governments will reflect on these points and seek to build sufficient time into the process for meaningful parliamentary scrutiny. For example, how might amendments be dealt with in what is essentially an intergovernmental process? That's something that we need to consider uh, more carefully. And the third and final point, presiding officer, is uh, one highlighted by several committees, the impact of increased workloads on their already busy work programmes. And uh, Ruth Maguire, on behalf of her committee, highlighted this too. Much of this work will be complex and technical in nature and will involve topics to which the Scottish Parliament has given limited scrutiny to date because these have been matters reserved to the EU. And questions have been asked and raised about the Parliament's capacity to undertake this additional work in tandem with our usual uh, legislative and inquiry-driven functions and whether resources should be reprioritised accordingly. It's a subject which I expect the Finance and Constitution Committee will return to in our scrutiny of the SPCB's budget submission for 2021 to 22, and I believe we're taking evidence from the SPCB uh, on this uh, next week. Uh, and it was an issue acknowledged at the start of the debate by the Minister for Parliamentary Business. Indeed, I think all members uh, acknowledged it. Uh, and I would agree with the, the remarks made just in his closing speech by Michael Russell, not words I uh, utter very often in this chamber, presiding officer, but I thought the comments he made about support for committees around legislation were very well made. And, you know, we've all had experience as members of committees sitting in a, in a stage two uh, debate uh, where a, a, a committee has been looking at legislation where our carefully crafted amendments prepared with the help from the legislative team in the parliament are gaily dismissed by the relevant minister uh, as being uh, poorly drafted or don't do what is intended. Now, uh, clearly ministers benefit from the backup uh, of civil servants in drafting their amendments. Perhaps we should look at giving a similar backup to uh, non-ministerial members of parliament to make sure our amendments are just as credible uh, and capable as theirs are. And that's something I think we need to uh, reflect upon. But presiding officer, if I can just close uh, my remarks, I've only been able to briefly touch on some of the topics raised uh, in the time available, but today's debate has certainly provided some valuable food for thought. Can I thank again all those who have contributed to the debate, uh, and I look forward to returning to these topics in due course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Fraser, and that concludes our debate on Parliament's evolving scrutiny function. Now, before uh, turning to decision time, I, I was disappointed to note that significant details of one of today's statements uh, on the cancellation of the higher exams appears to have been reported in the media uh, before today's announcement in the Parliament. Now, I would remind members that the government provides a copy of its statements under embargo to opposition parties to assist parliamentary scrutiny. That information is provided in good faith, and just as members expect the government to follow guidance and make statements to the Parliament in the first instance, there is an equally important obligation and expectation that all members and all parties will respect the confidentiality of information provided to them. And given the subject of this afternoon's debate, 
I hope that members will note my remarks. And we turn now to decision time. There's actually only one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 23565 in the name of Bruce Crawford on Parliament's evolving scrutiny function be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Ruth Maguire on the 70th anniversary of Human Rights Day. But we'll just have a short pause until the uh, members and ministers move seats. I would remind members to wear their masks, to observe social distancing when leaving the chamber and in following the one-way system around the parliament. Thank you.